Turn it. <clears throat> Good morning. Turn in your Bibles, please, to Genesis 25. Before you are seated, read this with me, please. And we will teach a number of principles this morning. And in our listening, we will worship God. Amen. As we listen and hear, what does God want to say? Uh, you see me up here on the stage, right? You see me, but... And you hear my voice, but there is the voice that you really want to hear. And that is, what does the Holy Spirit want to say to you? Right? So, Isaiah 30, verse 20. You will see your teacher stand in front of you, but you will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way. Walk in it. Uh, so that is our prayer today, that you will not only hear my voice, but you'll hear more than just my voice. You'll hear what does the Lord want to say to you in a personal way, because you are a child of God. You are a treasure, a human being with a lot of value, Amen. that God is loving you and caring for you and leading you in your life through many different uh, experiences, um, tribulation, trouble, good times, bad times. Now, the first principle, and it is Genesis 25, verse 1. Read it with me. <clears throat> then again, Abraham took a wife, and her name was... Keturah, okay. What happened to Sarah? She died. Genesis 23, verse 2. How many children did Sarah have? One. What was the name of their son, Isaac? And his name means laughter. Why, why did they name him laughter? <laughs> Go ahead. Go ahead and laugh. <laughs> Why did they name him? <laughs> Why? Merry Christmas. Okay, because how old was Sarah when she had him? Yeah, 90 years old. And Abraham was, <laughs> Abraham was how old? 100 years old. Wouldn't you laugh too? That history is important. Now, before Isaac was born, Abraham had a son through the maid of his wife, whose name was Hagar, and his name was Ishmael. Wow, you guys are awesome. You know more than the average, you know, whatever. <laughs> okay, listen, Ishmael, Isaac, now Sarah is dead, and what does Abraham do? He has another wife, and how many sons does he have? Six. Very good. Look at verse 2. She bare him Zimron, Yokshan, Medan, Midian, Ishbek, Shua. These are men that we rarely hear about because when you look in your Bible, most of the Bible is about who? Isaac, an Isaac's son, his name was, well, he had two, Esau and Jacob. Jacob had how many sons? Twelve. And that part of the family of Abraham went down into Egypt, 70 people, and they came out three million a nation. What about these sons? These sons kind of disappear in our biblical history. They service at different places. Moses married actually a Midianite, uh, one of the tribes that came from a son of Abraham, Midian. Uh, but I just want you to notice this. Here is the life of Abraham, his family, his sons. He had eight of them. Ishmael, Isaac, and the six. 
But look at this at the core of Abraham's life. The very important thing is the miracle of Isaac. Isaac, that's the one. God is blessing Isaac. I've been reading about Isaac. That's why I'm bringing this up this morning. Isaac and his life. I, I love the story in the Bible, and I follow it, and I always find new things. And what I, my meditation in this uh, meditation is that Abraham had a natural life like everybody, like all of us. There's a lot of stuff that happens, but the core has to be there. You must be born again. You must have Christ in your life. No matter what you have done, no matter who you are, there has to be that amazing miracle of the birth, the new birth, being born again of the Word of God, being born again of the Spirit of God, being born again of Christ by believing in Him. And in believing in Him, then the core of your life is not shaken but it is eternal, undefiled, that fades not away. That is something we're going to refer to in our message today on the palace, King Herod's palace in Matthew 2. And so uh, I think you got it. Did you get it? Oh, yeah. The core. How many sons? He had, he had a number of sons, but what, what is the point? Isaac, that's the point. The promise by faith. That's the point. Ah, 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 I can't believe. Ah, 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 I cannot believe it. I live forever. My sins are gone. My name is in the book by the grace of God. The natural life happens. You do this. You buy that house. You sell this. You get a divorce maybe, unfortunately, you get hurt, you're in the hospital, you get a cancer, you become a millionaire or something less, or you have one child or 14 or whatever. Life happens, but the core has to be there. You must be born again. You must be believing in Christ. And that miracle of the new birth, it sticks with you, you do not pass away. You are God's child. And God has given you a great gift. Merry Christmas. You may be seated. <clears throat> I went on uh, the internet and I looked up laughter and I found a video of a woman laughing. Oh, this is a couple of years ago. And I just watched her laughing. She had a very contagious laugh. And I ended up laughing with her and just enjoyed, uh, in, enjoyed that, her, you know. Okay. That's not important, is it? Okay, turn to Matthew chapter 2. <clears throat> we are looking at Herod who, if you go to your National Geographic magazines, which I, by the way, I find a great and nice little investment for the year, $18 or something, very affordable. You get one every month, and like I enjoy looking at people and things and science a little bit and natural history. It's full of evolution and so on, but you can get beyond that if you want, if that's what you're... But uh, there's an issue on Herod. And being in Israel at one point uh, over the years, we've been in Israel a number of times, and we've gone to Masada, where Herod had built a palace and a huge sauna up on a butte down near the Dead Sea. It's famous historically. He also built aqueducts, other palaces, uh, roadways, a, like a pyramid-type tomb for himself, which he was buried in. 
uh, and so on. He was called Herod the Great. He also built the Jewish temple that was there during the time of Christ. He was a arrogant, powerful tyrant who didn't think anything of killing people, gaining his way, doing his thing, his way for himself. And we can imagine those people because we have them with us still there in this world. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Matthew chapter 2, verse 1. Now, when Jesus was born in Bethlehem of Judea in the days of Herod the king, behold, there came wise men from the east to Jerusalem. We don't know how far east, Afghanistan, Uzbekistan, Tajikistan, Azerbaijan, from the east, Armenia, Iran, Iraq. Uh, where, how far did they travel? They were kings, which means they had territory, wealth, a palace, and the possibility of a coup, a political takeover, a military takeover of their kingdom. So leaving your kingdom, you run a risk. Maybe you will not be able to return because your best friend took over and you're banished. If you return, we will, they will kill you. There are many practical considerations when you consider in the ancient world a king leaving his kingdom, the expense of it, the time of it, the, possible, the possibility of traveling and not knowing exactly where you're going, except you're heading west following a star. A star. And many books are written about it and Certain astrologers, have it, have, I mean astronomers, excuse me, astronomers have suggested Kepler, Copernicus, they had different ideas about it. But in my view, I, I, and I'm, I'm only just to have an opinion on it, that it was the Shekinah glory of God leading the wise men to a particular place. And they could follow it and they maybe had Jewish ancestry because we know the Jews were scattered through the world by the Assyrians and then later by the Babylonians. We know that many Jews did not return to Israel when Cyrus the king said, you can go back. Daniel never went back. Daniel lived in Babylon and prophesied as a Jewish prophet and had an influence on Babylonian culture for sure. So maybe the wise man had some biblical reference to king of the Jews. Who are the Jews? Well, they are those that once were slaves in Egypt. And we have heard that they came out miraculously by a route never traveled before, even through the Red Sea, by the hand of God. They say there is God, and he is the God of their father, Abraham. The wise men maybe knew some of these things for sure because they knew the word Jew, a Jew, and then a king of the Jews. Maybe they understood that the king of the Jews would reign forever and ever. Like Isaiah said in Isaiah 9, 6 and 7, unto us a child is born, a son is given. The increase of his government will have no end. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father. Prince of Peace. We don't know what these wise men knew and why they would go at great expense and risk to go see him, except they represent people like ourselves and many people in the world. 
that are seeking God. I'd like to make a comparison between Herod and the wise men. Herod and the wise men from our text. Verse 2. Where is he that is born king of the Jews? For we have seen his star in the east and are come to worship him. There is in the world of Herod a natural mindset, and I think of Herod as a secular man. We would use this word today, you know, secular, as in a secular university, secular, um, a, a secu secular institution, secular mentality, a world that is not particularly religious or God is not at the center, but it is natural. We could say pragmatic, practical, pragmatic world of, of life. In that idea is also, I, whatever I do that I will succeed at, if I succeed, then, um, then it's fine. If I get the desired results, then it justifies the means by which I got there. If I have to lie to get more money and my goal is to get more money, that's okay. I can do it. If I have to cheat a little bit, bend the rules, I am pragmatic, practical. I can do what I need to do in order to get it done. This is many times in the minds of people. No one is really watching, you know. Nobody really cares. And as long as nobody finds out and as long as you can get away with it, then it's okay, you know. But the wise men are representing another type of mind, and it is we believe in the supernatural, that God cares about my decisions, and I want to live before him. And if he doesn't want me to lie, then I'm not going to. It doesn't matter if somebody finds out about it or not, I'm not going to do it because I'm living before God. If God has put a star in front of us, and we, he is saying in our hearts we are to honor him and we are to seek him. We are to look at the sign that is given to me and respect it as being from God, as something in the plan that I need to respect and recognize, then I will. Life is more than my sandwich. It's my heart, conscience, my accountability, my integrity, my dignity as a person in regards to God and truth. My life is more than my hormones, more than my brain chemistry, even though this is argued in our day and age but it's also me, my decision, my trust, my belief that God is a supernatural God that cares about everything in our lives, and we live before him. Herod and the Middle Eastern tyrants, the despots of that period, and recently, Saddam Hussein and many others, they are totally natural in their rule, Hassan in Syria, and they're totally based on ruling and power 
and their own desires and ambitions. There's another thing about Herod, and it is what we can say is anti-history. I'm speaking only in general terms. I'm using this from a article written by Chuck Colson, and his list is a little different, but basically very similar to what I'm saying today. Anti-history. History is not that important. Man cannot know really what happened. History is not my reference. You find it in our world in the United States when we, as believers, we want to go back and look at history and study what happened in World War II in the Nazi party in Germany. How did the Nazis take over? What happened? How were the people misled? How did it happen that 7 million Jews were murdered? How did it happen? I want to know, but many secular-minded people are not interested in it. They are thinking we are progressive, we are, we are moving forward. We will never make such foolish mistakes. Really? We are, on the other hand, the wise men are filled with the interest and the importance of history. What did the prophets say? What is the Bible saying? We are people of the past, the present, and the future. I want to see how, what the lessons are I can learn in the past. I think the wise men that were seeking for the king of the Jews were wanting to know what it was that was promised to the Jewish people. And essentially, the prophets are saying that all of history is revolving around the Jewish people. The Jewish people bring the Messiah. God visits the Jewish people. The Jewish people are going to rule and reign. The Jewish people are, the, the kingdom of God comes to Jerusalem. And there will be a king there whose reign is from everlasting to everlasting, Micah 5, verse 2. The third thing Herod did not have was no worship. And the wise men were all about worship. Where is he so we can worship him? Worship means it's coming from worth, worth value, worship, worship. The value, the value we place on God because we are in a way lost in this world, and we do not know what is really going on in it. I'd like to say something that will take a minute or two, a few minutes, but you have to follow it with me, and I know you can handle it, but it's, it's a pretty awesome concept. And it is... It is about an author, an author. An author writes a book, and, and before he sits down and he writes a book, he already knows the end, and he knows how it's going to go and act, chapter one, two, three, four. He knows the sequence. And in a way, God as God decided to make heaven and earth and have a sequence in history. And in that sequence, he already knew the end from the beginning because he is the author of life, of everything in the world. He is sovereign. Nothing can happen without him, and he knows the end. He knows all the effects. He knows what is happening, and he knows what is going on in this world. 
And this is at the very heart of our life, is to recognize him as the author and worship him, fear him, and respect him. We said this morning that we, it's like this, uh, this uh, illustration with this book. I went to find the biggest book I could and I have it in my, it's in my library, it's this one. <clears throat> it's, uh, what do you think it is? Yeah, it's a dictionary. Okay. Let's say, let's not say it's a dictionary, let's say it is the history in complete in an absolute knowledge of God, of everything that has happened, is happening, and will happen in space and time. Every molecule, every atom, every electron, every second, nanosecond, everything. Does God know it? God knows it. Is he the author of the world that we live in? Is there something here in this world that is outside of what he has designed and planned? He is the author of life. And like Abraham and his six sons, there's some parts in this book, and actually who knows how much, that is just stuff that happens. Abraham had six sons. Okay, great, good job. That's nice, big family. What else happened in your life? I've got to tell you this one thing, that if you hear it, you will laugh with me. It is unbelievable, this one thing that happened, that in our old age, me and my lovely wife, Sarah, who was barren her whole life, at the age of 90, we had a sexual relationship as husband and wife at the age of 90. I was 99. Talk about Viagra. <laughs> wow. How did that happen? You know, I had, I, you know, hey. It's real, right? How, how do you explain? Like, what happened with, with a man, an old man and an old woman? Do you get it? That's, like, amazing. What I want to say about it is, watch. In this history that we call life, there are those, those, those events that visitation that is like super history, that thing that Abraham is saying, listen, I had a normal, I had normal family and the whole thing, I had a big, and, but, but I got to tell you, there's something particularly unique that is unexplainable except faith. I believe God. I was a worshiper of God and Christ gave me a son. This is, an ex this is a picture for all of us in our new birth. When we believe Christ, Christ was born in us, and we could almost say it's, an, it's a book, the mind of Christ that is in this book. Let me explain it. This is before there was time and space, before there was heaven and earth, there was only God, okay? Before there was anything, there was God in his mind and God in his word. In the beginning is the word, the word was with God, the word was God, Christ. The word became flesh and dwelt amongst us. This always was. You know, your Bible has always been, and it always will be, 
because he has always known everything. He knew that he would. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Page one here. History started. And on it goes. God spoke to Abraham. There it is, right there, in the context of history. There it was, God, with Adam and Eve in the garden. The word of God dwelt, walked with them. The voice of God walked in the garden. I say this to encourage us that we are part of the eternal. Look at our list up here. Ask Herod. Is there anything eternal in your life? He goes, I don't know what you're talking about. But let me tell you to the wise men that came to see the king, he said, listen, when you find him, tell me so I can come and <laughs> worship him. Oh, really? Are you a worshiper? You know, <laughs> yeah. There's a time when, what does it mean? You see, heaven and earth will pass away. It's almost like, <laughs> ashes, dust, dry leaves crumpled up. The wind blows it away, but not this, not what God has done in our life. Do you think there'll be anything like, like anything that we have ever done that like Herod, Herod in his secular mentality with his lust, desire, ambition, his pragmatic approach to life, it's about me, is any of it, any of it going to remain? No. Proverbs 11, 7, when a wicked man dies, his expectation shall perish. Psalm 112, 10, the wicked will see and be vexed. They will gnash their teeth and waste away. The longings of the wicked will come to nothing. Proverbs 10, 28, the prospect of the righteous is joy, but the hopes of the wicked come to nothing. Ecclesiastes 9, 6, their love, their hate, their jealousy have long since vanished. Never again will they have a part in anything that happens under the sun. I said in the prime of my life, must I go through the gates of death and be robbed of the rest of my years? Whereas you know what shall be on the morrow, what is your life? It is a vapor that appears for a little time and then it is whew, vanished away. We drove by the cemetery up here on Moravia Road yesterday. And I asked the guys in my car, how many people do you think are known in that cemetery? How many people are alive today that know anybody that is buried in that cemetery? How many people alive today know anything about any of those people? What if no one knows anything about them? What is worst is, what if God knows nothing about them? I never knew you, he said in Matthew 7. What about King Herod? We're sure he's in this great big, big book of time and space, but there's nothing there that came from the transcendent God. There is no birth. There is no seeking. There is no star for him. There is no baby in Bethlehem. There is no worship. There is no savior. The man has nothing, but he has children and power in a kingdom, and it is whew, gone, but you and me are like the wise men. We have, we have seen 
the, the sign has led us, something in our hearts that came from God and said, go seek him, you will find him. Yeah, but it will cost me a lot. Yeah, but what, you, what it costs you is nothing compared to what you gain. What you gain is me and that which is eternal. Let's read the story, verse 3. When Herod the king heard these things, he was troubled in all Jerusalem with him. Look up at our screen here. If my life is natural, if I don't care about history, prophecy, references, if I have no worship in my life, how easily my life will be troubled. She shouldn't have said that to me. He shouldn't have done that. How easily my life is troubled by somebody preaching the gospel. Oh, get out of here. Leave me alone. I'm not, please don't talk about that. My life is troubled. Because in John 4, 13 and 14, Jesus said, if you drink this water, listen, you will thirst again. In Herod, you will thirst again. And tomorrow, you will thirst again. And the next day, you will thirst again. Because, look it, in this world of space and time, you will thirst again. Because you're made for the eternal. You need Christ. You need to drink from this water that I give you, and you will never thirst again, he said to the woman at the well. When we become students of this book and we learn to eat it like food, it grows in you, and he that hears will hear more and hear more and hear more. And I was thinking the wise men, after they found him and they followed and they left, and when they left, I think God added more and more and more because that is like this book that is in your life. When all the stuff is happening, there is that which is growing doesn't pass away. And you hear more, you get wiser. Learning we doesn't mean we don't fail and have our weakness and confusion and our trouble. It simply means we've got something that will never pass away. Hallelujah. Okay, look at the next one then. He says here, when he had gathered all the chief priests, verse 4, and scribes of the people together, he demanded of them where Christ should be born. And they said unto him, In Bethlehem of Judea, for this it is written by the prophet. Now, Bethlehem is only about five miles away from Jerusalem. Couldn't Herod have sent a troop down there? Where is it written? It's in Bethlehem. Okay, listen, guys. Run down there, get down there this morning, check it out, report back to me tomorrow. Very simple order, but he didn't do it. It's very fascinating how the flesh of man can't get it. Doesn't know what to do, when to do it. Doesn't know how to get it done, actually. Doesn't really know what he's looking for but he's given the information. That's why point number two, anti-history, or not getting it, not, not caring, not having the wisdom and the understanding. And then in verse 7, Then Herod, when he had privily called the wise men, inquired of them diligently what time the star appeared. I wonder what they said. He could say, where are you from? And they could say, 900 miles east of here. We have traveled nine months, one year. When did the star appear? Oh, about a year ago. It was in the winter solstice. About a year ago, we saw the star. And they asked questions, and they got answers. When he sent, verse 8, he sent them to Bethlehem and said, go and search diligently for the young child. When you have found him, bring me word again that I may come and worship him also. 
When they had heard the king, they departed, and lo, the star which they saw in the east went before them till it came and stood over where the young child was. That's why I think the star was the Shekinah glory of God or an angel guiding them like a star that went right over where the child was. And uh, that specific direction was an amazing work of grace. And I think we have similar things that happen in our lives as well, because if you seek him, you will find him. If you ask, he will answer. If you knock, it will be open. I really believe that God is on our side. The humble, he will give greater grace to the humble. He will resist the proud, even though they are so close, five miles away from the greatest miracle of all, the coming of the Messiah, and they miss it. Verse 10. When they saw the star, they rejoiced with exceeding great joy. The star came. It seems like it came again. Like they came to Jerusalem. They're like there's no star, apparently. They talk. They're there. And they decide to go. They, Herod says, go. And then as they are going, the star appears again and leads them to exactly the place where they need to go. And they were very happy about it. There it is. When they were come into the house, they saw the young child with Mary's mother and fell down and worshipped him. When they had opened their treasures, they presented him gifts, gold, frankincense, and myrrh. These are honorable men, educated men. But more than that, there's a mystery. There's a spirit of worship. There are not a lot of people around. There's only eight different parties or individuals in the group that knew about this this event where was rome when this was happening where was herod when it was happening the secular world cannot see or discern or recognize the things of god but it's been given unto us to know them we are fascinated by them we are seeing them we are we are thinking about them. We are believing in them. We are walking in them. Like we saw in Turkey last week when we were there. In Albania, and the Albanians gave me this tie, and I think they might be watching the service like we did last, uh, last week on this Sunday. We were in Albania in Pastor Dennis's apartment with a big screen TV listening to Pastor Steve preach a great message on the sky. They gave me the tie, and I want to thank them publicly <laughs> as they're listening. We had a great time together. There are people around the world that are seeking him, and they are finding him. And the world in a big, mega kind of mentality of empowerment, practical, pragmatic, natural living, without any worship, but bulking up, conquering, overcoming, in inventing, discovering, and living a life that a one day, here it is, one day, it'll blow away. All the satellites, all the iPhones, all the technology, all the knowledge, and the Bible, it says, the scripture gives us wisdom in salvation. A man that has wisdom in sociology and psychology and science and chemistry and math and everything you could ever imagine, what does it mean if he doesn't know salvation? What does it mean if he doesn't know that the Savior came and you are to seek him and you will find him? What does it mean if I go to hell and I know all kinds of scientific information and I know a lot and I'm highly educated, but I've lost my soul? The Word of God makes us wise unto salvation. It teaches me that Christ came to save me. 
that God made us not just to be a wise, clever man that is practical and successful. God made me to be a worshiper, to fear him and know him and know him and give him the gold, the deity of Christ, the frankincense, the sweet aroma of his life and the myrrh, that, that burial spice that predicted his death as a baby. You will die. And this gift of myrrh is representing your very purpose for coming, is that the word of God would become flesh, dwelt among us, take, up him, take himself our sins upon his body, die on the cross, be raised from the dead to give to us the gift of redemption, eternal life. That's what Christmas means to us. That's what it is, the treasure, the, the, the real core is this, that Jesus came because God so loved us that he gave us his best and only. He himself came so we could become worshipers of the true God, the living God, the powerful God the forgiving God, the caring God. Amen. Would you pray with me? <clears throat> Pastor Shabelli returned from India and Nepal, and he is going to speak tonight. And Don Fisher also share a few words. Would you pray with me? Lord, perhaps somebody listening or here in, on the internet or here in the auditorium needs you. And they're going to say in simple faith, Jesus, I believe in you. And when they say that, in their heart, they are born of Christ, born of God. Say it, please, in your heart to God. God hears you. God cares what you're saying. In your heart, say to Christ, I believe and trust in you. Raise your hand here in the auditorium, anyone at all, and the ushers will give you a booklet. Raise your hand, say, yes, I want Jesus in my life. Anyone at all, yes, I want Jesus in my life. Anyone at all? Mm. Thank you in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen.